Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Andre Borain, the Dean of the Faculty of Law, and I will also act as the program director tonight. On behalf of our host, the Vice Chancellor and Principal Professor Cheryl De La Rey, I welcome the honorable members of the Diplomatic Corps, members of the Executive, senior management, colleagues and students, and in particular our keynote speaker and colleague, Professor Franz Fulhun. As well as his family, I've noticed his parents are in the audience uh, as well. It is also my honor to introduce our Vice Chancellor and Principal, Professor Cheryl, uh, Cheryl De La Rey to you. Professor De La Rey is steering the University of Pretoria, our educational vessel, with vision, insight, and integrity. In everything she does, she ensures that the University of Pretoria excels as a leading university, not only in South Africa, but also in Africa, and in fact, worldwide. It is in many respects due to her hard work that we are being recognized locally and elsewhere as an institution being driven by values of quality, relevance, and impact, and also for developing people, creating knowledge, and making a difference. As one of Professor De La Rey's initiatives, this lecture series, therefore, perfectly matches the vision of the University of Pretoria. Professor De La Rey, we would like to thank you for establishing this uh, platform where experts in their respective fields are able to engage with a, w a wider audience, sharing their research results, views, tendencies, practices, thoughts, and fears. Tonight, we have the privilege of listening to the 11th presentation in this series. Honorable and distinguished guests, Professor De La Rey will now introduce our expert speaker for tonight, my valued colleague, Professor Franz Fulhun. Thank you very much, Professor Borain. Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, and our special guests, uh, particularly our guests who have come to the University of Pretoria from the Diplomatic Corps, from our government departments, uh, may I add my voice of welcome to that of Professor Borain. It's thank you very much for joining us this evening, and I'm looking forward to the lecture by uh, Professor Volyun and also the discussion that we will have thereafter. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to firstly thank Professor Borain for that very kind introduction and his very positive comments on my role here as Vice Chancellor and Principal. But I have to say that I regard myself as being in a very privileged position. And there are two reasons I say that. Firstly, the University of Pretoria is one of South Africa's largest research intensive universities. And our latest figures as of today suggest that we now have over 47,000 full-time students here, about a third of whom are postgraduate students. And when I think about being the head of a university uh, with this many young people enrolled, I am reminded of what a special and privileged responsibility we all have here at the university, myself and my colleagues. And that is, we have the opportunity to educate, to nurture and develop the future generation of leaders for South Africa and Africa and the world at large. Secondly, I regard myself as privileged because I have the opportunity to work with some of the most outstanding intellectuals in South Africa, one of whom we're going to hear this evening. Uh, as Professor Borain indicated, I introduced the expert lecture series because I believe it's very important for a university like the University of Pretoria, but particularly for a public university in a developing democracy like South Africa to, to play a broader public role to ensure that our intellectual expertise is disseminated beyond the traditional forms of academic journals and scholarly publications, that we engage more broadly with members of the public, uh, 
in open fora such as the forum this evening, um, you can have an opportunity to hear some of the latest thinking on, on, on the issues of the day, but also hopefully to leave having considered a different point of view and a different perspective. And perhaps an opportunity to hear questions being posed that will linger on in our minds and we will consider further and perhaps influence our behavior in a more positive direction and thereby develop uh, our country as a whole. Tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce to you somebody who leads one of the flagship academic programs here at the University of Pretoria in the Faculty of Law. And I wish to encourage you to have a look at the publication that should be on the desk before you because there is more information about our sense of human rights, which I regard as one of the University of Pretoria's flagship academic departments and centers. But without further ado, let me introduce our speaker this evening. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Franz Fulyun has a very long resume, but I want to give him as much time as possible, so I'm going to be highly selective. I do want to inform you that he holds a number of university degrees. Uh, perhaps I can particularly mention the master's degree he has in Afrikaans, his LLB and LLD from the University of Pretoria, as well as an LLM from Cambridge University. And as you have heard, he is the director of the Center for Human Rights in the Faculty of Law, and he's also, he holds a full professorship. His research area is international human rights law with a special focus on the African regional human rights system. And he has published very widely in this area. I will not read all his publications. But in addition to his scholarly contribution, he has been involved in advocacy and training uh, on the issue of the African regional human rights system. He also contributes to a number of journals and he is editor-in-chief of the African Human Rights Law Journal and co-editor of the English and French versions of the African Human Rights Law Reports. I do wish to also mention to you that he is highly regarded by his peers, both nationally and internationally. And the, a good expression of the stature in which he is held by his peers is that he holds a rating of a B1 from our National Research Foundation. That rating informs us that Professor Franz Fulyun has been judged by his peers to be at the cutting edge of his chosen area of specialization and is regarded by some of his peers internationally as being a leader in this field and an exceptional one. He has been awarded a number of fellowships and research grants over the years, and in particularly, he was awarded the University of Pretoria Chancellor's Award for Teaching and Learning. So he's an academic of note, having made contributions in teaching and learning, in scholarly research, but in advocacy, training, and education, and has a singular and exceptional record in contributing to public debate here in South Africa and across the African region. Professor Vulyun, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the podium and we look forward to your address this evening. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thanks very much for being here. <coughs> The um, title of my lecture Sorry. The title of my lecture this evening evokes the novel Time the novel Love in the Time of Cholera by Gabriel Marquez <clears throat> a story of love unfulfilled for nearly a lifetime, 
but eventually consummated on a riverboat sailing under the yellow flag denoting cholera, thus banishing the lovers to indefinite exile. In most of Africa, prejudice, discrimination, and violence against persons based on their sexual orientation, gender identity, and sexual identity, together referred to as a term with the term soggy, is the norm. LGBTI persons, and I will sometimes refer to them as sexual minorities, suffer affronts to their dignity and live in fear of violence. There is no place for them in many countries in Africa flying the flag of homophobia. Homophobia denotes a range of negative attitudes, ranging from antipathy and contempt to revulsion and hatred toward, towards LGBTI persons or those perceived to belong to this category. It may be, but need not be, based on irrational fear, like other phobias, because it can also be inspired by religion or cultural beliefs. While it is an internal attitude, it is externalized by hate speech, acts of violence, or repressive legislation. Because the triggers differ from person to person, and the context from country to country, there is no single manifestation of homophobia making it perhaps more appropriate to talk about homophobias. Others may prefer the term homo prejudice. The premise of this lecture is simple. The law has an important role in entrusting and ensuring a dignified life, a life of love and interpersonal connection to sexual minorities wherever they are. In summarized form, the argument is first, it should be recognized that sexual minorities are entitled to the equal protection of the law. And second, because of the pervasive influence of laws criminalizing sex, same-sex acts, acts or conduct between consenting adults, both men and women, in private, and I'll use the perhaps unfortunate shorthand anti-sodomy laws to refer to this legislation, these laws should be abolished. My argument does not advance the right to same-sex marriage for the main reason that this is not currently a central concern of sexual minorities, at least outside South Africa on the continent. Making a legal argument without engaging in the many forceful counter-narratives permeating our societies would be facile and unproductive. The legal argument is therefore followed by an examination of three of the major justifications for not affording equal protection to LGBTI persons. Homosexuality is, in, is un African, it conflicts with majority morality, and it runs against the grain of religious dictates. In addressing these justifications, I will leave the comfort zone of international human rights law, and taking a more multidisciplinary approach, I will turn to history, anthropology, and religious studies. I will then consider some extra legal strategies, solutions, and offer concluding thoughts. However, before proceeding to the legal argument and counter arguments, let us consider first the most recent global, regional, and national background to this issue. Homosexuality has, over the last two decades or so, become a very prominent matter of international discussion. In much of the world, on the one hand, there is a strong tendency towards liberalization. In Africa, most of Africa at least, on the other hand, there is a countervailing trend which could be characterized as one of intolerance, rejection, and the lack of tolerance. In brief, a culture inspired by and reflecting homophobia. This duality is revealed at the three levels at which states function, the global, the regional, and the national. At the global level, there is no treaty binding on states which uh, deals with the rights of LGBTI persons or making any reference to SOGI. The closest the international community has come is the adoption of these non-binding Yogyakarta principles, talking about the application of international human rights law to SOGI. However, this was adopted by mainly non-state representatives. On the other hand, numerous human rights bodies consisting of independent experts have, unsurprisingly, I would say, 
held the view that LGBTI persons are rights holders under these United Nations treaties. By way of illustration, the United Nations Human Rights Committee, which monitors the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, one of the main human rights treaties under the UN, has, in one of its decisions, namely Tunin versus Australia, held that the existence of an anti-sodomy law in one of Australia's federal states, Tasmania, violated the right to equality and to privacy of those affected by the law's very existence. Even if bodies of independent exp experts um, did not deal with this issue in an inclusive way, it is in any event at the political level where one would should expect normative advances to take place. The foremost forum in which these advances could be expected in terms of human rights is the UN Human Rights Council. Now, in 2008, uncertain that the uh, SOGI resolution that was intended would pass at the Council, a number of states presented a statement to another forum, and that was the United Nations General Assembly. This forum was presented by 66 states. A counter group of 57 states, spearheaded by the Organization of Islamic Con Cooperation, the OIC, issued an opposing statement. In this statement, the states expressed their serious concern about, first, the lack of a legal basis rendering SOGI a protected right, as you can see. Secondly, about the erosion of the principle of non-interference in the domestic affairs of states. And thirdly, about the potential misuse of the term sexual orientation to normalize pedophilia. Only six African states lent their support to this statement, while 31, those states, joined the opposing statement. South Africa, surprisingly, given its domestic SOGI protection, did not align itself with any of these two groupings. In March 2011, 85 states joined a similar statement, this time made at the UN Human Rights Council. In this instance, five out of the 85 states, those in green, as you can see, South Africa included, supported the statement of concern about violence against persons on the basis of SOGI. A little bit later that year, June 2011, South Africa, in fact, introduced the first resolution on SOGI to be adopted at the Human Rights Council. This resolution was passed, but of the 13 African member states of the Human Rights Council, only one small in the Mauritius in the, in the green there, um, adopt, uh, uh, voted in favor, eight against in red, and two in orange abstained. Libya at the time was suspended from the council. The adoption of this resolution paved the way for the first official United Nations report on the issue of SOGI and led to a panel discussion on this matter in March 2012. Since then, a number of further meetings had taken place across the globe except in Africa, to raise awareness of SOGI issues and to identify needs and strategies. A concluding conference to pool insights and collective strategies took place in Oslo in April this year, co-hosted by Norway and South Africa. At the regional level, the oldest of the human rights systems at the regional, which has been, regional level, uh, which has been established under the Council of Europe, the European system, has since its enlargement in the 1990s been extended to 47 member states. One of the requirements for joining the Council of Europe is the abolition of anti-sodomy laws. The Council's main human rights body, the court, European Court of Human Rights, has since 2000 dealt with an ever-increasing array of cases related to SOGI. In the most recent time, and in respect of the most recently joined members, of the Council, the court played a prominent role in holding that the banning, for example, of gay pride marches, which still had happened in Russia and Poland, violated the Convention. Not only the Human Rights Court, but other Council of Europe institutions like the Committee of Ministers and the Parliamentary Assembly also had put SOGI squarely on their agenda. And a new institution, the LGBT issue unit, was created within the Council in 2011. In Latin America, developments have also taken 
uh, course in this direction in the last few years. The General Assembly of the Organization of American States had, since 2008, adopted a number of consecutive resolutions, including making calls for the decriminalization of anti-sodomy laws in the few states in that region where they still exist, mostly in the Caribbean. Although it has for a number of years not dealt with the SOGI issue, the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights recently established a unit for LGBTI rights. The other human rights body in that region, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights in February this year, in the case of Karen Atala versus Chile, ruled that a decision of the Chilean Supreme Court, which stripped Karen Atala, a lesbian mother and judge, of the custody of her three daughters on the basis of her sexual orientation had violated the American Convention. In stark contrast, the African Union has been largely silent on SOGI issues. Like the OAU before it, the AU has in fact not yet pronounced itself, but has made only veiled references to these issues, mostly in line with those comments issue, uh, issued in respect of the um, OIC-driven resolution um, and statement before. In the absence of the political bodies taking a stand, it had been left to the African Commission on Human and People's Rights, the main human rights body within the AU, to deal with this issue. For many years, the African Commission dealt with this in a pragmatic way, raising concerns about sexual minority rights when they arose, but as a collective, the African Commission did not either decide that the issue of SOGI is included or excluded from the African Charter's ambit. When this matter, however, was brought to a head in the application for observer status to the Commission by a South African-based organization, the Coalition of African Lesbians, in 2010, the Commission refused their application. The two interrelated legal reasons provided for the ref refusal was, first, that CAL's objectives are not consistent with the AU Constitutive Act, and these are the objectives, and that the Charter does not explicitly recognize the right to non-discrimination on the basis of SOGI or the rights of LGBTI persons. Aimed at the advancement of gender equality and social justice and the protection of the rights of particularly vulnerable individuals, CAL's objectives, in my view at least, meet the criterion of having objectives and activities in consonance with the fundamental principles and objectives of the African Union and the African Charter. As for the lack of an explicit recognition of sexual minorities' rights in the Charter, one should note that the Charter has been generally interpreted as a living instrument and not, not as a captive of original textual strictures. For example, even though the African Charter does not mention the concept indigenous person or people, the Commission recognized this concept in the absence of any reference to the word or concept indigenous. This stands as an unequivocal example that the protection of the Charter is not denied to groups merely because the Charter does not explicitly recognize that group by name. A further contradiction of the, commis uh, the Commission's reasoning in respect of the Cal refusal is found in the Commission's own practice of allowing mainstream NGOs with observer status to raise during its public sessions issues pertaining to the protection of the rights of LGBTI persons. Allowing them to speak on these issues implies that the Commission has accepted that the protection of sexual minority rights is part and parcel of the mandate of the African Charter. Tellingly, the Commission in 2009 has already granted observer status to Alternative Cameroon, an NGO which has an explicit mandate to work uh, for the right to health of men who have sex with men, MSM, and other sexual minorities. Refusing CAL observer status is thus also con inconsistent with the Commission's own practice. At the national level, <clears throat> in most of Europe and Latin America, decriminalization of sodomy is now the norm. More significantly, though, has been the decisions to abolish anti-sodomy laws in other regions, exemplified by recent decisions in India and Fiji. In a historical judgment delivered in 2009 by the Delhi High Court, the 150 years old Section 377 of the Penal Code of India had been overturned, thus legalizing consensual homosexual activities between consenting adults. The Delhi High Court found that Article or Section 377 
violated the right to equal protection before the law in the Indian Constitution. Although some appeals had been lodged against this decision, it is of great significance that the Indian Attorney General decided not to file any appeal against it. Because of its wide-ranging influence as cultural hegemon, also in Africa, the experience of the United States is also relevant to us at the national level. In a significant departure, the US Supreme Court in 2003 declared anti-sodomy laws unconstitutional in Lawrence versus Texas, thus reversing its own 1986 decision in Bowers versus Hardwick. One of the factors affecting this reversal was the diminishing prevalence of such laws in states across the United States and also the changing attitudes towards issues such as um, opposition to same-sex marriage that you see reflected here in the United States. The 13 years since the advent of the new millennium has also seen a steady increase in the institutionalized recognition of gay marriage. Starting in 2000, the number has now grown to 17 states, and of these states, three are in Latin America and one in Africa. These advances are in clear contrast to developments in Africa over the last few years, most prominently in Uganda and Nigeria. Since the introduction of a private member's bill in Uganda in the parliament, namely the anti-homosexuality bill in 2009, much attention has been devoted to the negative, negative effects of this bill. Keep in mind that at the time of its introduction and still today, carnal knowledge against the order of nature, quote unquote, was already and still is prohibited in respect of both men and women. And that the penalty, the maximum penalty for this offense, was already increased from 14 years to life imprisonment. And consider that Uganda in its constitution already um, amended it in 2005 to outlaw same-sex marriages. One may then ask, what was the mischief at which this 2009 bill was taking aim? In its original form, the, will, the bill introduced the death penalty for so-called aggravated homosexuality. But in its reintroduced guise in 2012, this aspect has not returned. But other features remain, such as anyone who promotes homosexuality, for example, by broadcasting materials pertaining to homosexuality or funding of activities related to homosexuality is liable upon conviction to seven years imprisonment. Anyone in a position of social authority, such as a school teacher, who is aware of the commission of any of the offenses under the act and does not report it in 24 hours, is gu guilty of an, uh, of an offense and liable for three years imprisonment. The act applies to offenses under the act committed by Ugandans outside the territory of Uganda. Any international treaty that conflicts with the act, the act says, is invalid. After disappearing for some time from the legislative agenda, the bill has now reappeared and is currently under consideration. In Nigeria, just like in Uganda, anti-sodomy legislation existed since colonial times and conviction of this offense has long been punishable for, with 14 years imprisonment. In addition, in 12 northern states of Nigeria, Islamic Sharia law determines since 2000 that the death penalty by stoning may be imposed. With little comparable international fanfare, the Nigerian House of Representatives, this is the Nigerian case, has um, in the last two weeks, is, uh, is particularly on 30 May 2013, adopted a law prohibiting same-sex marriages and allowing for punishment for all those involved in such ceremonies. However, it is in three other respects that this Nigerian act breaks new homophobic turf. First, it for the first time criminalizes homosexual identity, as you can see, by prohibiting the registration of gay clubs, or rather, the, uh, the relevant is by prohibiting any show of same-sex amorous relationship directly or indirectly. Secondly, it aims to silence the voice of all LGBT organizations by prohibiting the registration, for one, of gay clubs, societies and organizations, their sustenance, processions and meetings. Third, it extends the law's grasp beyond the LGBTI community by stipulating that anyone who supports the registration of such clubs, 
commits an offence and may be punished to 10-year imprisonment. In other words, if President Jonathan would sign this law into um, effect, not only same-sex acts and same-sex marriages, but being gay in the broad sense and being pro-gay would be criminal and carry penal penalties ranging from 10 years to death. In two other countries, Kenya and Zimbabwe, attempts to entrench equal protection of sexual minorities as part of recent constitution drafting processes were not only unsuccessful, but generated a contrary position, namely the adoption of constitutional prohibition of same-sex marriage. It seems very likely that a similar provision insulating same-sex marriage from any um, constitutional challenge will be one of the outcomes of the constitution drafting process currently in Zambia. A number of reasons peculiar to the period after the start of the new millennium may account for the African aberration, if you like, from the global trends outlined above. State behavior at the global level underscore an alignment between SOGI votes and geopolitical positioning in international relations. SOGI issues are seen to be driven by a Western political agenda of cultural imperialism. This perception of Western bias has been exacerbated by threats from Western donors such as the US and the UK, that donor aid would be withdrawn from states pursuing homophobic policies. The geopolitical context forms a background to a number of contributory factors at the national level. The first of these, I would suggest, is the backlash following greater visibility of LGBTI activism and activity in Africa since 2000. It is precisely when LGBTI activism engages and becomes more prominent that homophobia follows in full force. Those who come out first debunk the myth that homosexuality is un-African through the undeniable evidence of their real life experience uh, as our neighbors and acquaintances. And by transgressing the approach of don't ask, don't tell, they become the targets of the wrath of the disappointed and the embarrassed. A second factor, A second factor is the Americanization of homosexuality, which, through a process of sociocultural globalization dominated by the US media, has produced the notion of a uniform global gay identity. Also in Africa, SOGI activism has, as a consequence, been heavily influenced by this idealized notion of what it means to be gay. Adverse African reaction to the perceived imposition of a homogenized gay identity has since 2000 to a large extent been exacerbated by the inclusion of same-sex marriage as a core component of this notion of global gay identity. While same-sex marriage has, in the US, emerged as the end point of almost essentially long gay activism, there has been no recently, uh, until recently, been no comparable activism in Africa. The superimposition of a discourse that links homosexuality and same-sex marriage by the hip is clearly acontextual and presents a red flag that spurs on homophobia in societies where gay persons do not even enjoy the most basic of rights. The upsurge of a particular brand of religious, religions, religion in Africa is a third factor to consider. The last few decades have seen a steady growth of religion in the global south to the extent that there can be talk of a southernization of religion. This general trend has been overladen by a dramatic rise in the renewalist Christianity in these regions. This expansion of evangelical religions in Africa coincided with the loss of territory of the US evangelical movement on social issues within the United States. One country where this influence has been markedly felt is Uganda. An illustration that US renewalist forces are actively involved in this country appears from the facts of a recently instituted court case filed by the Sexual and Minorities Uganda Smug Group against such an evangel evangelist, Scott Lively. He <clears throat> is an outspoken anti-gay activist and has for a long time worked together with counterparts in Uganda. In a case before the US federal courts, it is alleged that he has committed or conspired to commit crimes against humanity and and this case is brought under the U.S. Alien Tort Claims Act. A case is made to show 
Lively's influence on the drafting and adoption of potential adoption of the anti-homosexuality bill on the basis that he was a prominent speaker at a very well publicized event that took place in March 2009, very uh, shortly before the bill was introduced on 20 April 20, uh, 2009. These factors converge from time to time to feed a sense of moral panic. Moral panic, as used by Stanley Cohen, refers to a group of persons, for example, becoming defined as a threat to society uh, and its values and interests. We find, <clears throat> for example, such uh, moral um, panic arising in the United States of the 1950s in the context of the Red Scare and the gay witch hunt of McCarthyism. Although the reasons for the Nigerian adoption of, uh, inter adoption of the Nigerian law recently is not clear, one should take note that it was introduced in 2006. And in 2006, it seems two important events had uh, an influence on Nigerian society. On the one hand, for the first time in Nigeria, a significant group of LGBTI individuals came out in the context of the biannual International Conference on AIDS and Sexuali Sexually Transmitted Dis Infections in Africa, ICASA, which was held in Abuja in December 2005. Another factor is <clears throat> the decision of the South African Constitutional Court in the Furi case, um, allowing essentially for gay marriage in December 2005. There are clear indications in the media in Nigeria at the time that this decision was met with great consternation. Looming moral panic is amplified if it becomes the basis for political action. In the Nigeria of the day, fixing public attention on the threat posed to Nigerian society by gay marriage served two purposes, that is in 2006. First, it united Nigerians in the face of violence that broke out between northern Muslims and Christians claiming the death of hundreds following the publication of the now infamous Danish cartoons. And secondly, it was a drum on which to sound support for President Abbasanjo's third term bid beyond 2007, which was raised at that time. Clearly, a simple causal link would be difficult to draw conclusively between these two circumstances and the introduction of the bill, but they do provide a sense of the societal context and suggest some reasons why Nigeria in 2006 became the first African site for a need to breed an exceedingly homophobic legislative regime. To the legal argument. The next step is to formulate an argument based on international and national law. The argument, obviously, is that uh, not in itself to be sufficient, but it is, in my view, such a legal argument, a necessary condition to curb homophobia in the continent. It proceeds as follows. The first step is to ensure that there's a recognition that sexual minorities are rights holders and accepted to be rights holders under international and national law. In other words, that they benefit from the equal protection of the law. At the UN level, all but two AU member states are state parties to the ICCPR, and all states in Africa are party to the African Charter. These states are therefore legally obliged to follow the judgments and findings of the UN human rights system, at least at a political level. Because rights are granted in the language that is inclusive in all these treaties, the language of every individual, everyone, and every person, it is linguistically impermissible to restrict rights to a smaller segment of the population. But it's not only the language, but also the logic that dictates this conclusion. That is, for example, unthinkable in even the most repressive state that a court would not entertain allegations grant the equal protection of the law to someone who is, for example, tortured just because the alleged victim is a person who is gay or lesbian. Once it is established that at least there is an equal protection of the law shield, one should look at the specific rights that may be invoked, and the following rights invite themselves, set out there. As far as the right to non-discrimination is concerned, this right is protected in the most important international instruments and at the domestic level in African constitutions. Although the African Commission 
has not had the opportunity to deal with any specific argument dealing with a case, the Commission had affirmed in one of its decisions that non-discrimination in Article 2 of the African Charter, which is the non-discrimination clause, is to ensure equality of treatment for individuals irrespective of a number of grounds, including sexual orientation. As far as the right to privacy is concerned, it is provided for in the ICCPR under the constitutions of all African states, states, thus making the omission of this right from the African Charter much less significant. Depending on the particular circumstances that require the protective shield of the law, many other rights may come into play. If the matter is the refusal of a government body to register LGBTI organizations, for example, it is the right of association, and if it's refusal of HIV, antiretroviral medi medication, for example, it is the right to health care. Paradoxically, it is Uganda that provides the best evidence of this contention. After a protected legal battle, um, the case of Victor Juliet Mukasa, the chairperson of Sexual Minorities Uganda, ended in a favorable judgment by the Ugandan courts, acknowledging state liability for the harassment and victimization by police of LGBT human rights defenders um, in 2008. The court found that these rights, Article 23, 24, and 27 of the Ugandan Constitution, dealing with the right to personal liberty um, and the prohibition against inhuman treatment and unlawful searches, had been violated. In another case, also in Uganda, Kasha versus Rolling Stone, the Ugandan High Court in <clears throat> on 30 November 2010, ruled that the publication of photos and names and addresses of homosexuals in, in the tabloid, the Rolling Stone, under the heading, hang them, they are after our kids, constitutes a violation of the affected people's rights. The court's judgment was of little benefit though to David Kato, a Ugandan human rights activist and one of those named in the Rolling Stones article who was killed at his home on 26 January 2011, barely a month after the decision was, was handed down. Another avenue to explore is that of minority rights. Although there is no internationally agreed definition what constitutes minorities, it seems that there is consensus towards the inclusion of at least ethnicity, race, language, religion, and culture. These grounds are considered stable categories and um, categories of cohesiveness. Extending them to include sexual orientation and gender identity would require an argument about the nature of shared characteristics and the rationale um, for minority protection based thereon. The question may well be posed whether minority protection is a suitable vehicle for LGBTI claims. Clearly, the different letters LGBTI of the acronym represent a great variety of sexualities, and even within each of these categories, there is great divergence. However, insofar as, for example, anti-sodomy laws are targeting all the members of these uh, groups collectively, to a certain extent, there could be a claim made for the use of minority rights as uh, the framing mechanism for the discourse. In any event, even if individual rights framing is the way chosen, these rights should be framed and invoked in solidarity with the collective and at least in awareness of the similar effect, not only on uh, one individual, but on a group of individuals. Despite these complexities, the term sexual minority is used here, as it is more broadly in the African discourse, not to fit a predetermined legal category necessarily, but as a term denoting solidarity and as a strategic option so as not to invite knee-jerk reactions to words or phrases that have to be, uh, that have um, a very pejorative ring in many African ears or that invite explanation. The fact that sexual minorities are entitled to the equal protection of the law does not detract from the fact that their rights, like the rights of anyone else, can be, under certain circumstances, limited. International law prescribes the parameters within which such a limitation is allowed. The Siracusa principles developed to guide states in potentially limiting the rights under the ICCPR requires the application of a proportionality test, which you see articulated there. 
The African Commission has opted for a similar test by adjusting Article 27.2 of the African Charter. And at the national level, a similar two-phased approach is found in most constitutional adjudication as exemplified by Section 36 of the South African Constitution. Accepting as a starting point that sexual minorities are rights holders under the African Charter, therefore does not mean that the notion of culture and religion becomes irrelevant. These factors or grounds may be still invoked as part of the limitation or justification exercise. And it is to these justifications which I now turn. The first justification is that homosexuality is un-African. To meet this justification head on, one should try first, I would think, to understand what is meant by this term. Looking at the discourse, it seemed that different people used the term un-African in different ways. I will try to dissect and group these understandings and e address each of them in turn. The first conception is that un-Africa in some way denotes that Africa is exceptional from other parts of the world. In other words, homosexuality is not Africa but is associated with other countries. Such a conception is clearly not tenable, irrespective of the yardstick one applies. Using the world map as a um, yardstick, African states are not alone in denying basic rights and maintaining anti-sodomy laws. In fact, they form part rather of an Afro-Arab bloc as far as this issue is concerned. If the yardstick is not states but people, the conclusion is also that African exclusivity uh, does not ring because homophobia and its manifestations are by no means the preserve of Africans. Media, media reports confirm that homophobia is alive and well in the United States and recently on the upsurge, for example, in France. A second understanding of un-African is suggestive of African uniformity. In other words, assuming that there is one particular African way in which this issue is being dealt with. Now, of the 75 states in the world, 37 um, of, of, of 37, no, of the 75 states in the world still having anti-sodomy laws in place, 37 are in Africa. On this map, one can see those in Africa, in the Magenta, are the ones that still keep the death penalty <coughs> and in respect of anti-sodomy laws. Dark orange denotes life imprisonment. Light orange, more than 10 years imprisonment and yellow, less than 10 years. Looking at these states, four groups emerge. The first group, Arab states. Due to the close link between law and religion in these states, century-old Quranic dictates resulted and still maintain a rigid criminalization and hard, harsh penalties, and comparatively brief periods of French colonial rule did little to reverse this position. The second group are the Portuguese ex-Portuguese colonies. These colonies have all inherited the 1886 Penal Code of Portugal. However, there's little evidence that this provision had been applied in any of the colonies in any significant way. The reason may be twofold. On the one hand, there is the fact that the Penal Code was in fact abolished in Portugal in 1945, and that played a role in the colonial attitudes in col colonies persisting after that date. On the other hand, the colonial experience of Portugal has been minimalist and lacked the institutional arrangements and other trappings of, for example, the British colonial model. The third group of states are the Francophone states. To understand the very limited extent to which any of these states criminalize consensual sex practices, one has to keep in mind that France abolished anti-sodomy laws after the French Revolution in 1789 and it was never made part of subsequent criminal codes. Legislative silence in Francophone Africa, therefore, also uh, illustrates the reliance on the colonial model, with the exception of a few states, such as Cameroon and Senegal, where specific legislative measures had been adopted um, after independence. This leaves the ex-British colonies to constitute, to constitute the fourth group. Most of these states maintain anti-sodomy laws. Now, English anti-sodomy laws have the origin in the 1533 Vice of Bagri, which was a codification into an act of the English Parliament under earlier canon law. This codification 
may be understood in the context of the break between English King Henry VIII and the Catholic Church, resulting in the need to place under secular control all matters, including the sin of buggery. The codification also has to be read against the background of Henry's tainted moral stature, as it followed the Pope's refusal to in approve Henry's divorce in 1532. To some, this sequence of events inspired the need on Henry's part to draw a firm line in the by then precariously shifting sands of sexual morality. It was the 50, 1533 Act as amended that later served as the blueprint for the, the Indian Penal Code of 1860 and then through the Queenland, Queensland Penal Code for the criminal codes of most of the ex-British colonies. As you will see from this, <clears throat> there are great similarities between the Indian and the Queensland Penal Code, and an almost exact copy has been made, has made its way into the Ugandan law. The only difference is the harsher form of punishment which came later, imprisonment for life. In fact, bringing to bear contemporary anxieties, anxieties and perhaps UP policies, this would be a serious instance of plagiarism. This formulation also served as a model for the colonial impositions in at least Nigeria, Kenya, Gambia, Tanzania, and Malawi. The supreme irony is that the UK abolished this very same law in England and Wales in 1967, just as the post-colonial period started and these states gained their independence and their legal autonomy. Having regard to these four categories of states, the conclusion is inescapable that the regulation of same-sex conduct in present-day Africa is contingent upon a historical coincidence. Evidence of the un-African basis of anti-sodomy laws is much more convincing than evidence that homosexuality is un-African. The third contention, homosexual absence. This is a descriptive understanding of un-African in that it denotes that homosexuality does not exist in Africa as a matter of present reality. Obviously, this understanding is easy to counter and require no reliance on the anthropological data, for example. This understanding denies LGBTI persons the right to speak as Africans. It comes down to the question, who gets to say what is African and what is not? Who defines the debate and who gets to be included in defining what homosexuality means? It is hardly possible for any African today to claim that he or she does not know or see sexual minorities around them. Even if they are absent in any particular community, they have risen to continental prominence. Some of the most prominent would be Simon Nkoli, South African gay activist, Victor Mukasa, Ugandan tra trans activist mentioned before, Joel Nana, Cameroonian HIV campaigner, Fanny and Eddie from Sierra Leone, who was murdered in 2004, and David Kato, Ugandan teacher and gay activist, murdered in 2011. One could also use a more collective approach and refer to all the LGBTI organizations that exist only in our sub-region. Three of them are indicated here in Mozambique, in Zimbabwe, and in Botswana, despite the fact that anti-sodomy anti laws still exist in those countries. Even in Lesotho, we recently saw Matrix Support Group emerging and organizing the first Gay Pride March, 31 May 2013. The homophobic reaction of political leaders calling for the denial of full citizenship or even encouraging harm to sexual minorities within their countries paradoxically recognizes the existence of these very communities as part of the African landscape. Irrefutable evidence is provided, for example, in the court record, and I just cite two cases. The first is the conviction in 1997 of Kanan Banana, Mugabe, President Mugabe's predecessor uh, and the first president of Zimbabwe, of 11 counts of sodomy and debauchery and indecent assault. Another example <clears throat> is the conviction of 21 of the 52 men found on this queen boat in Cairo for offenses termed contempt for religion and um, debauchery. This um, incident inspired the making of this film all my life and thus became part of the narrative of popular, popular culture in Egypt. A third contention is that of the idea that in pre-colonial sub-Saharan Africa, 
there was no homosexuality. Although it is beyond the scope of this paper to present a comprehensive overview of anthropological data and evidence on this issue, I attempt to meet the crux of this argument. My task, in a way, has been made much easier by the publication in 2001 by this book, 530 page, uh, 360 pages long, um, denoting and giving examples of the existence of um, instances of homosexuality in pre-colonial Africa. Undoubtedly, there are serious difficulties in presenting this kind of evidence. Because there is little written or other documentary evidence on which to rely, much of the evidence is based on anthropological studies and historical accounts by Europeans. The vagaries presented by the translation of both language and experience and the possibility of biased worldviews loom large. The many recorded instances of homosexuality in pre-colonial Africa also have to be located and understood in the historical and socio-cultural contexts. But even if these caveats are followed, enough examples remain that suggest same-sex desire as such. I give a few examples. Evans Pritchard, the British social anthropologist, after a lifetime of research am among the Azande of Sudan, concluded, as you can see, that homosexuality is indigenous, that they do not regard it as at all improper, indeed as very sensible for a man to sleep with boys when women aren't available. In the past, this was a regular practice, and some princes may even have preferred boys to women when both were available. There's also the work of the German anthropologist Kurt Falk, after a long sojourn in Namibia, or what is now Namibia, reported homosexuality as well as various forms of same-sex marriage among the Khoisan-speaking populations in that region. There's English anthropologist Jill Shepard, who reports about the presence of lesbians in Mombasa, Kenya, today, and links this to a long-standing social phenomenon in that region. And lastly, in my shortlist, is the Belgian missionary Father Gustav Hulstadt, who tells us that there were a relationship of husband and wife between Nkondo women in the Congo area. And these relationships are described as arising from intense and intimate love between two women. Two firm conclusions seem to be justified. The first is that there is little support for the notion that same-sex sexuality did not exist in traditional African societies. Any claim to the contrary would suffer from being over-inclusive. Second conclusion would be that there is little evidence of homophobia as we know it today in traditional African societies. But even if you remain unconvinced by this evidence, to insist uncritically on one particular reconstruction of tradition and to argue for its perpetuation merely because it was once so is based on an unjustifiable monolithic view of African culture. Even if homosexuality is an import of modernity, as so, in fact, are designer jeans, the wristwatch, and the electric guitar. It is not only that cultures evolve, but that they should evolve in response to continuously being subjected to moral criticism and revision. The last understanding I encountered of un-African is a mere kind of denialist approach holding that even if homosexuality existed or exists in Africa, it should not exist. The argument seems to be that even if this is the case, that homosexuality just should not be tolerated in Africa. This understanding, if it is one, hovers, for me at least, between denialism, wishful thinking, and romanticizing an idea of Africa in which the nuclear family is perpetually in place where patriarchy remains unchallenged and diversity does not exist. I turn to the second justification, the majority morality. Whatever methodologies we would use, the outcome is bound to be the same. A majority of Africans disapprove of homosexuality and in particular open manifestations of same-sex sexuality. The question is what weight should be given to these views. And here I return to the hard Devlin debate of the 1960s, in a way, because many African countries are grappling with issues in the way in which they were presented then. 
Now, Devlin, on the one hand, argued that the law should enforce shared morality because the society would disintegrate if the moral code is no longer adhered to. Hart's retort was that this normative claim rests on a highly disputable, disputable generalization for which there was no empirical support. Hart's retort is linked to the proposition put forward by John Stuart Mill that only concrete and demonstrable harm to society justifies coercive regulation by way of the criminal law. Just like Devlin was not able to offer an empirical basis for his claim, proponents of this thesis in this context in contemporary Africa have also not provided arguments based on empirical evidence or projections. The failure to advance an argument that goes beyond generalized fear-mongering is also evident from the Ugandan anti-homosexuality bill, which proclaims the idea of the bill to be the strengthening of the nation's capacity to deal with emerging internal and external threats to the traditional heterosexual family. By not explaining the nature and extent of this threat, the, interference, the inference is that the institution of the family in Uganda is so fragile that it would, by necessity, be threatened if any form of consensual homosexual intimacy is allowed. What is the empirical basis of this fragility? Only proof of the actual cost to society should be able to outweigh the undeniable cost of enforcing morality to individual autonomy and self-fulfillment. As the recent arguments before the US Supreme Court on the, base, on the issue of same-sex marriage demonstrates, one of the forceful counter-narratives about this issue is the idea of the backlash, which suggests that turning to courts to vindicate rights is too often counterproductive because decisions not aligned with the majority's views are difficult to enforce and cause social resistance. Without fully canvassing this complex issue, my retort is to refer to two seminal US cases. It is true that <clears throat> Board of Education decided in 1954 effectively desegregated American schools and was met by immediate resistance from Southern racists and experienced many problems of implementation and had since been eroded. However, this case also clearly illustrates that without federal intervention to protect the rights of historically marginalized minorities, their rights will continue to be rejected by groups intent on discriminating. The third justification I identified is the uh, dictates of religious conviction. Now, invoking Christianity and Islam and not traditional African religions to justify homophobia does not seem to sit well with the argument that homosexuality is un-African. It seems to be incompatible to advance the argument that homosexuality was not part of a traditional life world untainted by external influences and at the same time argue that homosexuality is unacceptable to Africans on the very basis that these, influ these external influences in the form of these imported religions so dictate. While it would be disingenuous not to accept that the vast majority of African theologians agree that homosexuality, or at least the open expression thereof, um, is not in line with their religious views, it should also be noted that there is some dissenting voices. The most famous, obviously, is the um, first black South African Archbishop of Cape Town, who was very clear in linking the issue of racism to homophobia. But slowly emerging on the continent is another group of theologians who are slowly chiseling away at the monolithic idea of what Christian Christianity means in Africa. They happen all to be women. Among them, the trendsetter is Ghanaian Mercy Odiyoye, and she has criticized the perception of marriage as serving primary procreative purposes, and in the process linked the challenge to patriarchy of women to the issue of homosexuality and sexual minority rights. And she is supported to a lesser extent by those three other uh, African theologians who are now also showing the link between the protection of women's rights and the precariousness of the protection of the rights of homosexuals in Africa. Most African states subscribe, it should be noted, to secularism in their constitutions. It is constitutional supremacy and not religious supremacy that, from a legal point of view, holds sway. The South African Constitutional Court 
in the free case explained in this regard, it is one thing for the court to acknowledge the important role that religion plays in our public life. It is quite another to use religious doctrine as a source for interpreting the constitution. It would be out of order to employ the religious sentiments of some as a guide to the constitutional rights of others. Constitutional supremacy is not in conflict with the acceptance of religion as part of history and society, as exemplified by the adherence in a number of African constitutional preambles to Almighty God. However, when the constitution, even only in the preamble, embraces only one particular religion, the blurring between, between church and state becomes not only controversial, but costly. Zambia in no way professes to be secular. A preambular declaration to its constitution affirms that Zambia is a, quote, Christian nation, unquote. However, even in this instance, it is arguable that the legal force of the preamble as a matter of strict interpretation makes it subservient to the supremacy of the law affirmed by the more binding provisions of the constitution itself. Arguing that, the notion, <coughs> arguing that the notion that African traditional integrated religion in both the private and public worldviews should trump the principle of secularism buys, in my view, into an unacceptable notion of African exceptionality. Human experience shows that all people hold strong views, whether informed by religion or by their own encounters, education, disappointments, or joys. In a pluralist constitutional democracy, it is the constitutional compact agreed through inclusive processes that ultimately counts and not the extent to which these views are informed by one aspect of life, life for example, religion. Assuming that a convincing argument for equal legal protection has been made, there is no guarantee of a receptive audience. This section, therefore, looks at some extra-legal strategies to bolster the saliency of these arguments. Rights vindication, at least on the short term, depend on African judiciaries rather than on legislatures. However, judges do not act on their own initiative, but they are only able to react to suitable place, cases placed before them. It is therefore imperative that sexual minorities know that their rights are protected and that lawyers are able and willing to bring these cases to court. In homophobic contexts, it is often difficult to find lawyers who are willing to take up cases of sexual minorities due to fear of stigma, threats, or, other, or even violence. It is therefore incumbent upon law schools to train a new generation of lawyers who are not only conversant with the arguments, but also prepared to shoulder the burden of doing the right thing. As the example of Alice Com shows, even those who have been educated some time ago, and the law associations, associations to which they belong have a role to play. Advocate Com is a Cameroonian lawyer who has over many years represented many members of sexual minorities in the courts of Cameroon, despite death threats and attempts to have her struck from the professional register, because, in her words, it is the right thing to do. Lawyers should learn from and find perhaps reassuring reliance in the precedents presented by other African countries. The judgments of the Ugandan courts that we refer to are pertinent examples. These sh findings should be disseminated wider on the continent, at least among lawyers, but even <clears throat> in this regard, the European human rights system has, uh, for all its obvious differences, an important lesson. The lesson is that patience pays. Those of us so deeply disappointed by the African Commission's stance thus far should not lose sight of the lengthy evolution of this issue in the European uh, human rights system. The co progressive position today masks a 25-year evolution from the first unsuccessful submission in 1955 alleging that the German anti-sodomy law of the time violated the European Convention through many other failed submissions to the 1981 decision of the European Court of Human Rights finding that a similar law in Northern Ireland was in breach of the Convention. Another lesson from the European system is not to expect too much from regional institutions. Positions at this level tend to follow rather than lead national trends. It was only after a core group of states have decriminalized same-sex acts that the European institutions enforced these trends. 
on the regional level. The same trend is emerging in the relation to same-sex marriages in Europe. Activism at the African Commission has not taken perhaps very bold steps, but I think the approach to focus on equal protection of sexual minorities and their right to be free from violence as a threshold issue is the wise way to re-engage with the African Commission. At the national level, further, part of an incrementalist approach may be to depart from a premise of strategic essentialism by arguing, for example, that sexual orientation is an innate and immutable characteristic. Although adopting such a stance does a very grave injustice to the complex nurture-nature debate, it may be the best way to square up against the obsessive fear about LGBTI advocacy and proselytization. It is this fear of mass conversion to homosexuality that underlies the statement in the preface to the Uganda Anti-Homosexuality Bill, for example, that it, the bill, departs from the premise that same-sex attraction is not an innate and immutable characteristic. Whatever strategy is chosen, it should be occupying, accompanied by social activism. It was important that the challenge against sodomy laws in South Africa was not brought by individuals, but by the National Coalition for Gay and Lesbian Equality, a forum for gay and lesbian activism that was also involved in the political reforms of the day. Successful implementation of the Treatment Action Campaign case, in which the government was ordered to provide ARVs, nevirapine, to all pregnant women living with HIV, can in large part be ascribed to the supporting presence of a high, highly visible and vocal social movement. And the NAS case in India provides another example of collective action and social activism between a broad alliance called Voices Against 377, consisting of LGBT and non-LGBT groups. Social activism will also only emanate if there is greater awareness and understanding, not only of sexual minority issues, but of sexuality, more generally speaking. There is an acute need for greater openness and a national conversation about sexuality issues in all the countries of our continent, of which SOGI should be a clearly articulated part. These campaigns have to focus on indigenizing, if you like, Ugandanizing, Zambianizing, and so we could continue, of sexual minority issues. This could take the form of using local languages, building on and further exploring existing terminologies. But it should also build on local practices, experiences, and understandings to create African-rooted homosexualities through which Cameroonian psycho sociologist, excuse me, Gwebogu calls metissage. Allowing myself to be served by one stereotype about sexual minorities, let me ask, who are better placed to give content to a creative and playful Africanized homosexuality than the members of these groups themselves? Botswana pop star Shanti Lo, this is the indigenization of the languages, Shanti Lo provides a lead. Her transgender male to female identity in Botswana is a well-known fact, but never expressly stated. She presents a localized gay identity form, which is culturally integrated, authentically grounded, and socially accepted. It is lastly, in terms of strategies, crucial that LGBTI organizations should affirm alliances and be mainstreamed Many advances for gay men in Africa in particular have, been, have come through the public health route. When states recognized the disproportionate risk of HIV to men who have sex with men, MSM, they started including MSM issues into their HIV prevention and promotional programs. The MSM discourse opened maneuvering space for gay men and for sexual minorities more broadly in many African states. LGBTR I organizations should increasingly branch out to link sexual minority issues with and seek out intersectionalities with gender, poverty, socioeconomic vulnerability, marginality, nationality status, in order to build solidarity networks of anti-subordination, seeking responses to oppression 
on all fronts. In conclusion, I have not mentioned South Africa much, <clears throat> but even if homophobia is not any longer state-sponsored here, its manifestations are no less painful to victims of sexual and other forms of violence, hate speech, and social exclusion. Efforts to create an environment conducive to equal citizenship should continue, for example, by the adoption of hate crimes legislation covering SOGI, which is ongoing. With one foot planted geographically in predominantly homophobic Africa and the other constitutionally in the global sphere of friends of SOGI, South Africa is in an excellent position to play a role of bridge boulder between the two opposing worlds. It is clear that it has, after some ambiguity about its role, taken up the cudgel. The regional SOGI meetings held earlier this year, which culminated in the Osley event, was organized and co-hosted by South Africa and Norway, that is the Osley event. This process created an air of expectation that the Human Rights Council would adopt a decision to establish a special rapporteur on SOGI at its present session which is being held even as we speak. However, when Norway read the, statements on the statement from arising from these regional consultations and meetings on Monday, three days ago, there was only reference to a relevant mechanism and to the appropriate time. It is understood that South Africa's resistance is one of the primary explanations for the watered-down statement in the extent of time frame extension. South Africa's view is that the process should proceed more cautiously, with greater attempts at engaging the AU, the Arab bloc, the OIC, and the African Council of Churches. This position speaks to South Africa's relative failure this far to deliver on its role as potential global broker on the issue. But it also shows <clears throat> that there is certainly great force in state-sponsored homophobia in Africa and it underlines the risk that global advances may be held back by these states. Finding convincing arguments to see the lowering of the flag of homophobia, which is flying proudly over so much of the continent, is now, in other words, as acute as ever. Persuading states to recognize the right to equal protection, as I have tried tonight, may just be one step in that direction. I thank you. <clears throat> Honorable and distinguished guests, it's a great honor for me to congratulate our colleague, Professor Franz von Jun, on his excellent presentation. Franz, it is evident from your presentation that you are a master of your subject field and a scholar in the truest sense of the word. Congratulations to you and all those whose efforts have contributed to your presentation today. Your research on and conclusions about the far-reaching ethical and basic human rights issues in respect of homophobia struck a chord. Our audience was clearly moved by your knowledge and skillful presentation. We applaud your bold ideas and suggestions. The litmus test for a society is, however, how it treats minorities, even when basic rights like equality and human dignity are the cornerstone of a Bill of Rights. In the words of a former judge of the Constitutional Court, Mr. Justice Yacoub, quote, the Constitution has been enacted not merely to regulate government for its own sake, not merely to define the powers of governmental institutions, but for the benefit of all the people of our country. More particularly, the Constitution is here to ensure that people who are vulnerable and marginalized because of their poverty or for other reasons are protected and their quality of life improved." Unquote. To conclude, governments here and elsewhere will not necessarily step up and acknowledge these rights, and it is therefore a duty of all of us 
to examine our beliefs and to contribute to the betterment of society. Professor Fulyun, you clearly use your position and skills to build a solid foundation for encouraging a human rights culture in Africa. As a leading scholar in the Faculty of Law and as director of the Center for Human Rights, recognition of this kind is well deserved. Thank you. It's now time for questions. So I open the floor and uh, we have time to take two or three questions. Sir. Religion would be violating any law if it refuses to acknowledge uh, gay marriage. Thank you. So the question is if religion would violate any law if it um, allows gay marriage, if it refuses to allow gay marriage. Well, in a sense, I suppose I, um, I um, skirted the issue by not focusing on, on it, but because in a way, I think, you know, that would be the first part, but I'll try to come to, you, to the answer. The first part of the answer is that I think, um, in a sense, as I try to argue, partly the uh, skewing of the whole issue of protection of sexual minority rights through the filter of uh, gay marriage um, has uh, been leading to the detriment of the whole um, campaign, if you like, the efforts to ensure even the more basic equal protection of the law. So in a sense, I'm suggesting that one should build step by step, ensure that there is equal protection, in other words, that the ordinary rights that are available to everyone should be available to gays and lesbians or uh, everyone in the LGBTI category. And the next step, I think because of its pervasive influence, sodomy laws should be abolished. Whether that follows, whether it then logically follows that, you know, same-sex marriage is the next target, I suppose is, is debatable. I, I would suggest that, um, again, it depends on one's view about the division between the sacred and the, and, and the secular. To what extent is the state in which you find yourself and is the idea of a constitutional state also interlinked with um, being um, a sacred space? And my contention, and I, I suppose my answer would be that as I read most African constitutions, and referring to that as the framework, they are constitutional supremacist states. And in such a state, it is the constitution that is supreme and not a particular value of a particular segment of society. Um, there are constitutions, yes, um, perhaps uh, that uh, sub subscribe to the idea of Sharia in a much more pronounced way. And there, I would say, one runs into a, a more difficult area because then, in a sense, it is the renegotiation of the very constitutional compact that is important because one has to accept that you now, in a sense, are bound and, and framed by the constitutional uh, context in which you find yourself. Most of them, I would argue, in most of Africa, certainly, it is a secular uh, constitutional supremacist context which does not really bring in the issue of whether religion trumps law. The question is whether the constitution, as interpreted, the rights which are there, whether that um, aligned with the limitations clauses which may be in place would be um, uh, trumping any, any legal aspect. I mean, I think the limitation clause also holds the answer, and I think we all agree that all rights may be limited. So even if you have the right to freely associate, let's say that is marriage, when could these rights be limited? And that is part of the constitutional compact. It cannot be that it is a, a, a moral pressure of a particular segment of society that can override and be the reason to limit and justify the um, curtailment of rights. It has to be demonstrable how that serves a social need that is pressing and important in a democratic society. So I know I didn't answer specifically, but hopefully making the, um, the, the link to the context of the Constitution would provide some guidance to think about that. <clears throat> More questions? Uh, 
So, at what stage and to what extent should the international community intervene with these African states um, that are actively violating the rights of sexual minorities? Well, thank you. So, the question is whether, at what stage the international community should intervene? Well, intervention is a, is a large word. It can take many forms. So, intervention in its most drastic form would be military intervention, for example, to stem gross human rights violations. We wish that the international community, for example, intervened in a place like Rwanda, and there's a debate about the international community's intervention in, in let's say, Darfur. But we are certainly not talking about that. The intervention, I think, is a, is, a, is a systematized and an institutional intervention. And it comes really through the different human rights documents and instruments and treaties. And if you then look, for example, at the Human Rights Committee that I cited and its decision in the Tunan case, which clearly says that um, anti-sodomy laws are against the right to privacy and the right to equality in the ICCPR. It is true that all states in Africa have subscribed to and are party to the ICCPR. So I think the intervention we talk about should come from the state parties that are all bound in a particular compact and that there should be stronger um, moral and political force exerted on states that do not confirm. There are many times when the Human Rights Committee, for example, when it considers state reports of African states that still have anti-sodomy laws in place. They criticize, they recommend that laws be changed. We have the UPR process, the Universal Peri uh, peer, uh, Periodic Review process at the UN, and the same kind of criticisms are leveled against African states. Now, at the moment, they, they seem to be free to also say, we will accept certain recommendations, but others we will not. That is possible when they do it, let's say, of the, uh, in, a, in, a, in a context that does not uh, impose legal obligations. But as far as there are legal obligations, either the strength of these, these legal obligations through uh, moral and political force and um, perhaps uh, stronger um, follow-up by human rights treaty bodies in respect of these measures, that I think is the, is the um, intervention that we see emerging and that perhaps will become stronger over time. One final question at the back. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, my name is Adam. I'm from the Center for Human Rights as well. Um, I, I just wanted to hear your, your views. I, I certainly don't agree with the, with the particular view I'll, I'll talk about, but I wanted to hear what you think about it. And, and, and I'm raising it because you didn't really touch, touch, touch on that particular issue. In a recent interview at the Zambian Vice President or Prime Minister, he, had, he, uh, he talked about several controversial issues, but one of the controversial issues was, was what he said about, about the protection of gay rights. And he said that if you ask even gay people in, in Zambia whether it's a priority, he said, they, they will say, well, there's no urgency in dealing with that. There's several other issues that we have to cover before we, we, we start talking about issues like that. And he suggested that even gay people themselves will prioritize other, other issues to, 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 for instance, uh, the, the sort of in other issues. Thanks. I suppose part of my answer, thanks for that, it would be <coughs> There is certainly something that is also called internalized homophobia or prejudice, so that there is a certain sense in which if you live in a society, in a context where what you are is criminal, you will internalize that view and you will perhaps be less assertive and less expressive. So the mere fact that a person who perhaps is to an extent openly um, part of a sexual minority is in a conversation with a political leader expressing him or herself in a particular way. I think one has to see it in, in that context. But I'm sure that it may be true, and it is certainly so, that, that, that people <clears throat> who are maybe comfortable within their sexuality and are members of, of sexual minority groups, so-called, would perhaps feel <clears throat> that their issue is not on the forefront of the agenda. And I would not have problems with that. I'm thinking that in a place like Zambia, where even an organization that merely wants to advocate, wants to educate and educate, is not allowed to exist. The bottom line is the ordinary laws of the land should allow that if a person wants to associate, he or she should be able to associate irrespective of their sexual orientation and gender identity. And that is a very far cry from saying we want our issue to be a special issue, to be on the front of the agenda.
I'm saying that one has to work incrementally, but even that starting point in the majority of states has not been reached. And therefore, really, my argument essentially is a modest one, is a one that says, let's start with equal protection and ensure that that message is permeated in all African societies. That doesn't matter if, it, if, if whatever the social, the status, the sexual orientation, the gender identity, there's equal protection of the law. What does that mean? At the very least, it means equality. <clears throat> it means um, freedom of association. It means you know, uh, access to health care. A further step may then be, let's say, anti-sodomy laws. Now the question is, should that be a priority in Zambia? Perhaps not a priority, but certainly the one does not exclude the other. As, as, as much as you may have other priorities in the society, clearly this is also for a small group within society, a very restrictive legal framing of their very identities. And I think the one does not exclude the other. And um, without saying that it should be the primary issue, it could be inserted, as I also argued, into, and that strengthens the LGBTI movement, is by not making LGBTI causes exclusive, but permeating them and uh, finding the intersectionalities with other causes such as poverty or minority status in many other respects. There's one more hand. This will be the <coughs> last question. Thank you very much, sir. Um, I am Nathola from the Department of Public Law and Justice of Victoria. Um, <coughs> what, what will be your response to uh, some states or uh, to some objectors who will say that gay rights as at least as it is being uh, currently propounded is um, another ideological or ethical hegemony from from the west being sort of imposed on african states well you know Maybe I jump to a very different um, scenario to answer the question. People are saying that uh, the International Criminal Court, by prosecuting mainly, mainly African leaders, is a Western imposition and imperialist uh, mechanism. Um, the mere fact that uh, many Africans have appeared before the International Criminal Court and are prosecuted, I think, <clears throat> can lead to a certain impression, perception of bias and kind of targeting African leaders. But at the same time, my argument always is but look at this from the point of view of the victim. Does a victim really care whether <clears throat> Africans and not Africans or people only in Africa and not in other continents are held accountable and that there may be less of uh, recurrence likelihoods of a particular uh, crime against humanity being uh, perpetrated on a particular territory? The victim obviously wants to see accountability so my answer is, yes, I can see that. I can see that there's an element and it is framed in that way and it, the discourse is very much colored. And also the idea of a homo homogeneous kind of gay identity. There are certain elements that we've seen. But that is viewing it in a very particular way. If you start viewing it and you do accept that there are people who are falling in these minority groupings in Africa and you look from that kind of grassroots level up, then you see the matter differently. Then you're asking, but does that protection improve the life status, the basic rights of these groupings within society? And then, even if there are some elements of Western imperialism, it cannot trump and undo the very, very important debates and arguments that I tried, I suppose, to raise tonight. Thank you, Franz. Well, the discussion is clearly hotting up, but uh, Professor Fulhun will still be available in a while. So, uh, honorable and distinguished guests, on behalf of Professor De La Rai, Professor Franz Fulhun, other members of the executive and the faculty of law, I would like to thank you for attending this 11th presentation of the prestige lecture series. Also allow me to express our appreciation to the University of Pretoria and staff members involved in the coordination and execution of this event. Finally, on behalf of Professor De La Rai and the University of Pretoria, it gives me great pleasure to invite you all to enjoy refreshments in the foyer in celebration of this occasion. I thank you all. <laughs>